the spiritual path, the upward way, follows very definite and clear steps. By identifying these steps, by understanding them, when you come to each one of these stages or steps, you will, it will help you to understand that you're heading in the right direction. All of these stages, phases, are a common experience with everyone, absolutely everyone who has started out on the path and completed it to the end. So it is extremely well-known, well-defined, all mapped out by those who have started with the first step and gone to the very end of it. So remember that fact at first. There is no reason for you to ever be in the dark as to the procedures by which you go from your present unwanted nature to a nature that is far above it and free from the past. So I'm going to go over these various steps with you in various ways tonight. Now the first step, as you should know by now, is the step of simply being hungry. Eh? You know what it means to be hungry spiritually? The world has set its banquet out before you, and you've gone there, haven't you? A thousand times, and look at the spread they put out. This world has all the money. This world has all the food, all the power. Those Look at those enormous buildings in that enormous city. Who do you think owns those buildings? The world, they've got it. It all belongs to them. So they put out the feast and they say, come and partake of this. And everyone does. And they have to go back time and again, don't they, to that? They go back to that food, but they're never satisfied. Clear already, isn't it? You know what I'm talking about. <coughs> what was it? The marriage, you know. That career, you know how hopeful you were? You were just about ready to get that promotion or sign that contract and everything was going to go great. I tell you, even if you got the promotion or signed the contract, it wouldn't make any difference at all. The hunger would still be there, right? So that's the first stage. You know, there, there's something wrong. Look, as little children, you knew it. Didn't you look at your parents? Didn't you see them, your mother crying, your father getting mad? You knew something was wrong. You even saw them pray, didn't you? You heard them sing hymns. You heard them sing a hymn about the God's promises and they went home and had a big fight. And it scared you, didn't it? Didn't it scare you, all those fights in your home? So what the world has to offer doesn't satisfy the hunger at all, does it? So we look around. We look around for a long time and, again, fall for the feasts of society. They've got them with gold, pla gold platters. Oh, the, the way they doll it up. They've got all the flowers. They've got all the fancy drapes. They've got everything to lure us in and it worked, didn't it? And you went out of there hungry and you had to come back. How about the bill? Tired of paying it? Running out of the wish to reach into your wallet and pay the price that they ask for that feast? Which never does anything for you anyway. So, first of all, we're hungry. Then we collect a little knowledge. Then we get some facts. And the first facts, the first fact makes it quite clear that the hunger we, we sense. You, look, I know it. You know it. When you were six years old, you started to get hungry. Mama didn't, didn't have a thing for you. Physically, yes, because you're still a child and the physical comfort is there and that's okay. Papa didn't have a thing for you. Papa wanted you to become the high school football star. You didn't want to play football, did you? Contradiction already, huh? The demands on you. So you start to collect a few facts. 
that this sensing, this intuition, this truition was right after all. What the? I'll tell you, that's an interesting point. As you grow, as you develop, you can say, you know, that was right. And you'll think back to certain instances when you were a teenager, maybe, where you said something. It was right! And then society set the platter before you and you went for that. Because you didn't know any better. So we can't collect facts about the, the human condition that we've been brought into. And after that, after you collect a certain amount of knowledge, here's what comes next. Fear of action. Because some of the facts you have collected have begun to tell you that you have to do certain things. It's really undoing things, isn't it? But we're speaking as if it's doing something. You have to do certain things, and look, God, that scares you. You, ha you have to do certain things, which means you have to stop, stop doing certain things, which means all those silver platters and all that feast that's set out and all the rewards that you've been getting, you, you can't go there anymore. You can't go down to that big building. You can't look at the list of occupants of that 50-story building and want to see your name as one of the big doctors, one of the big lawyers, one of the big engineers. You know how it was when you were younger? You went into places like that and automatically you saw your name there. You can't do that anymore. You have to withdraw all that desire and that puts a great fear inside of you. First, it's not really clear in your mind what you have to do. The, the knowledge hasn't been you know, complete enough yet. And so it's hazy, foggy, and you don't know how to act. So you start to wonder you start to wonder as to what you've got yourself into, and yet you can't go back now because you've already confirmed to one degree or another the rightness of it. This is where this is where a class like this comes in to help someone, where they start to get confused. They start as you start to get clear in one area, it gets more confused because more is asked of you. Oh, the more but look, please, as you go on, the more it is asked for you, as you as you go ahead and do it, you're gonna get more. If you don't demand a thing of yourself, guess what you're going to get? Exactly nothing. Now, so we've come to the stage where you, you know that you have to do something, but you don't want to. Now comes an extremely critical stage, the fourth one. Not many do it. This is, where, this is the stage where people start to go wrong where they've got all this knowledge. Now, I talked on the phone with a man just two nights ago who was in this stage, which I'll tell you about maybe later. No, I'll tell you now, very briefly. He phoned, and at first he was all kindly and told me how much he was interested in the truth. And little by little, his old nature, his old nature began to creep in. He began to change from the kindly Dr. Jekyll into the fierce Mr. Hyde. Right on the phone, I could catch for the first word. I caught it. Then a little later, the second word. Pretty soon, he was slandering and attacking. You know what I did, by the way? I said good night and dropped the phone. And I order you to do this with sickies. Don't you? Are you aware of what they're doing? You're, you're gullible if you stand and, and take that. You know what he's doing? He's slandering the truth. Never mind about you. Don't you let anyone attack truth. So we get to the point where we're going to have to do something different than what we've ever done before. First you were afraid to act. Now you have to act in spite of your fear. Huh? Go against it? Look at all those people you think are going to criticize you. For getting, you don't want to use vulgarity anymore, and they do. And you don't want it anymore, so you leave their company. You know, they're going to accuse you. What are they going to accuse you of? Of being, getting religious? Of being pure? Of being a hypocrite? They'll tell you every possible lie. You want to get away from their lies, from their greed. You want to get, you don't, you don't want to hurt other people quite so much anymore because you don't want to hurt yourself as much anymore. And that projects itself outwardly. And you see you can't join those people out more. You're going to have to go against them, aren't you? Go ahead and do it, even if you're afraid. I can't tell you how beautiful that is, how powerful it is to act while afraid to act. 
And don't you have any intelligence at all? What are you doing trying to appease the people who have wrecked you? Who have sent you down the wrong path and who want you to stay on the wrong path? What's the matter with your intelligence that you would even hesitate to say absolutely not to them? And get up and walk out. Put the phone down. Don't, don't be angry when you put it down. Put it down very calmly. Cut off the connection, that's all. Don't you dare get a thrill out of slamming the phone down on someone. You cut that connection because it's the right thing to do, whether it's in a telephone or in a relationship or whatever. If you act in spite of your fear, go ahead, right while being afraid. What will happen is you'll possess the land. You'll come to possession of a higher level of more insight, of freedom from the nagging, haunting, of the confusion. You'll get something that you didn't have before. Now, this possession, this spiritual victory, is the only stage in the five that I've listed to you in which you have nothing to do with it at all. You had to do with the first four. You know, the hunger and collecting the facts and the fear and acting against the fear, that's you acting against it, what we call you. But where there's possession, when you reach the higher level, did you create that higher level? You simply possess it because you're there, right? So that means that on this particular level, this possession that you have, there's no you there, and that's why it is a possession, something eternal, something lasting. Anything you gained has always existed. Well, hasn't God always existed? Has it reality always existed? So we get a little bit of it as we make a particular victory. This process I'm talking about, we go over and over and over a hundred times a day. You could go through it. In one day, you could go through it a dozen times if you're alert, if you are hungry enough, right? Now let's put a man, let's get a man right on the path itself. Do we have we get a, a physical path to represent the invisible path? Here's the man getting on it, and he's... He's hungry to reach the other end. And so he starts walking. And here's where the fear comes in. Remember the fear point? He starts getting afraid. Here's what happens. As he's walking, here's an actual man, say, walking on the upper path. At a certain point, he gets scared because the war medal that he has attached to him here starts to fall off, right? Wait just a minute. I'm a war hero. He's going to be scared, isn't he? He's been wearing that around all his life. Everybody told him he's a war hero. I'm a war hero. He tells himself he's a war And you get on that spiritual path and it starts to fall off. I'm not going to be able to call myself a war hero anymore. And he goes a little further and his college degree falls off. <laughs> Are you ready for that? <laughs> falls to the ground and he sadly looks at it, goes to the back of him and off the side of it. Good heavens, it was bad enough not to be a war hero, now I'm not a professor anymore. Or whatever the degree is. Goes on a little little further and the, photogra the photographs that he had of himself, they start to fall away, fall out of his pockets. How many of you have an album of your favorite photos of yourself? Huh? What would you do if you lost it? You, you'd lose your identity, wouldn't you? How many of you fondly go through it when you were nice looking and 18? <laughs> you compare that with the mirror of today. <laughs> remember, remember how heroic you were in high school? Those days are gone, aren't they? Well, anyway, the photograph, too, and you don't know who you are anymore. You keep going along the path. All these things that you've identified with, that you've collected, these are ideas, you understand, these are physical things we're talking about, but they start to fall away. This is because you thought that you were there. This, you should understand that. This was your whole identity up to now, these little pieces of paper. Of course you're going to get scared. Now what do you do? Oh, you let all the metals clang to the pavement as you walk along. 
You let the pictures flutter away as they want. I've told you, and I'll tell you right now, it is possible for you to put one foot in front of the other and walk forward while shaking. Now you see you have no excuse anymore for not walking the spiritual path because you can have both states at once. You can have your fear, which you do have, and you can walk at the same time. Where's your, where's your alibis now? They're all gone, aren't they? Well, what do you suppose is going to start back at the beginning of the cycle again? What do you suppose is going to develop this, this first stage of hunger, of yearning for, yearning to be free of the contradiction of pretending to be happy, of pretending to love people. Do any of you in this room or listening to this talk, do any of you, come on, put on a pretense that you like other people and you don't like them at all? Doesn't that tire you? All right. Aren't you a little bit hungry to see whether there's another condition than that? Well, I'll tell you that there is, but what you're going to have to do We've covered it before, and I'll cover it in just a slightly different way. You're going to have to see that the world, with its big buildings and its silver platters, has nothing at all to give you. If you're, if you're expecting something from this world, you're going to be disappointed. And you know why? Simple enough, because the world has nothing to give you. Has it? It has nothing to give you at all. Let's go back to our man walking the path. While he's doing that, would you like to guess what's on, what's on either side of him, of the path? D down in the, the gullies on each side, the ditches on each side. His friends. <laughs> you know what his friends are doing, cupping their hands up and yelling at our spiritual path? Traveler. First of all, see, they, you know, the, do you know that the devil is the most marvelous, skilled, accomplished actor in the history of mankind. Do you know that the Academy Award actors and actresses have nothing that the, compared to what the devil has? Now, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. First of all, the word cajole. How many know what the word cajole means? I just thought of it and thought I'd use it. I'll look it up tonight. <laughs> but I think it means to plead to someone. First of all, they plead. Didn't I just tell you when you start to say you want nothing to do with the crudeness of this world that people are going to start snapping at you and call you self-righteous? First of all, the people, your friends on the long, on down the gully, they're going to yell at you to come on back and join them in their silver platters and their big buildings and all their power and all their money. Then if you don't listen to that, they'll curse you. They'll insult you. They'll call you mad. What do you do? I, I wonder if you, you really understand a point I brought up a minute ago, which I'll re repeat. You tell me, here's the way I'll put it, I'll put it in a new way. You tell me what prevents you from walking forward in spite of everything. There is nothing. But you think there is something because you want to think there is something because you don't want to go. That old fear factor again. Or you're, you're gonna, you're gonna, you feel you're going to lose yourself. You're going to wander around and not know who you are. You don't know who you are now. You have no idea of who you are. Because you have 10,000 ideas of who you are. And they change, don't they? Don't they change a lot? Yeah? You, how many of you are nice people at 8 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> how many of you are grouches at 8 o'clock in the morning? Whatever way you start with at eight, by now nine you'll flip to the opposite, right? Now, I want to go into now, in connection with all this, something that you are all familiar with and which is, plays a major part in ordinary religious teachings and philosophies. Follow this with extreme care because I know 
that you have been confused by it all your life. You have heard and you have read that God, reality, truth, promises blessings to people. Okay so far? You understand what I'm getting at? It says in sacred literature, religious books, that if you put yourself under the guidance of God and pray and give your money and be devotional, that you will get a reward from God for that. Right? Now, let's look at some of the rewards that the religious books say that God will give you. One thing, and the most important of all to terrified human beings, is that God will give them eternal life. You look around and you see people growing older and you, you want something more than this life and this temporary body and you want something that exists forever. So when you hear the promise that you will live forever everlasting life, then you leap onto that as a much desired promise. Right so far? All right. Now that's just the bare beginning. The, the promises are endless. For example, if you pray and are a good religious man or woman, God will bless your marriage. God will give you peace of mind. And increasingly, lately, especially with the television preachers, you are told that you will be blessed financially. And that's getting into the mainstream of religious promises now. It used to be just small little groups of religionists used to do that. Now it's everybody. They're all getting into the act because they know that this is what people want. You see it. I just, I've watched it over the years gradually changed. Okay, let's keep the promises coming. The promise is that you'll be protected from evil, right? Nothing will harm you if you stay under the protection of divinity. On and on and on the promises. All right. But they don't happen. You read in the book that, that God will protect you from enemies, but you have enemies wherever you go. Inflation is your enemy. Your neighbor is your enemy. All kinds of thoughts, enemy thoughts are going through your mind. You were promised peace of mind. Where is it? Since you were a little kid and went to Sunday school and you sang hymns <coughs> and religious people are always talking about comfort, about being secure, about being safe in this world. And if you stay close to God, you'll feel safe. But you're not safe. I'm not safe. You understand what I'm getting at so far? All the promises people claim is theirs, but they don't have the promises. They claim them. I'm getting on to a, a most powerful point in a minute, but I want you to see the, the beginning of it. Religious people talk about being blessed of God, right? Every other phrase. God is blessing me. It's insane. God has blessed me. God has helped me today to solve a problem. Oh, what a gulf between their talking about God protecting, blessing, and loving them. Ah, love, that's a good one I should have put in, which I now will do. God loves me. God, God loves me and will take care of me. But if he does, how come I don't feel protected by his love? Now, someone who loves me will help me, help me. He won't let enemies either out there or up there get me. God loves me but I'm a mess. I'm terrified. 
most people are never, ever going to be honest enough to face the split, the division, the contradiction between their words and their state. Because most people are born liars and they stay liars. We are not going to put up with it in this room. Now, here it is. The promises of God are true. God does love you. Indeed, there is perfect protection, guidance, 100%. But it applies only to sane people. The promises have no relationship to sick religious hypocrites. all the beauty and all the protection that you want come to you only when you are sane, only when you're really spiritual. What's all this blab of the masses of people? They're, they're raving maniacs, every one of them. They don't know what it means to be protected. They kill each other for words. They kill each other. Don't you fall into the trap of the devil to think that there is no such thing as love simply because you haven't experienced it. And the reason you haven't experienced it is because you are still mad. Look how simple it is. God himself, truth, reality, is perfectly sane. Right? A clear mind have nothing to do with the insanity out there. Therefore, if you walk this path with all these stages that we discussed, and you go to the end where there's a possession for you, if you go there, then you will be sane, right? You'll be a sane human being with all, all, the, all this greed and this, these lies and all the hatred and all the violence that you, you used to have. Right. The minute you become sane, truly spiritual, then you have the promise right now. The sanity that you have received is the promise of everything. <clears throat> and authentically spiritually sane mind has no enemies has no need of protection the sanity is the protection are you following you see this enormity of what we're talking about the promises of God belong only truly to God's people not the people who go to church. Do you see why you do you see why as you grow spiritually you grow more silent? You don't talk so much about God, which is used to used to talk because it was just a word that comforted you. And if you if you need if you need comfort, you are uncomfortable. Right? So your mind becomes silent, your spirit slows down, and you understand at last, which I'll repeat now in another way, every promise you ever heard since you were a little child about eternal life, about having a new nature, about being born again, absolutely true, marvelously a fact. Now, if you can face the fact that you have not experienced that, 
that's your collection of knowledge and that will get you to the point where you're you see your fear and then you act in spite of your fear and you continue to go forward until one of your medals falls off and its weight falls off by the way the falling off the medal means one little self-identifying thought some vanity falling off and when you do this as you lose yourself you begin to change inwardly and you become look how simple it can be said without getting involved in complex religious phrases you become someone who thinks clearly who is without the burdens that you used to have and then that clear mind that clear spirit understands the fact that the promises of God can only be to someone who wants them. All these billions of religious hypocrites running around the globe don't want the promises of God. They want the promises of man, and they've got them. They've got the buildings, the 50-story buildings, and they've got the gigantic corporations and they've got the uh, enormous churches. Did you follow this latest point? That if you want the promises, then you can't be you anymore. Choice, huh? Get it through your minds once and for all. Uh, you think I'm going to say something semi-negative, don't you? Get it through your minds once and for all that you can put yourself on God's side and when you do that, it is done. See, as you move away from the devil, you move toward God. It's an automatic process. The two go together. And you get out there and you will experience in your life in a little way at the beginning one little tiny promise fulfilled inside of you what you will see you'll have to see for yourself because it all comes in a little different way but what you will see uh, when you walk the spiritual path at the start you're pretty wobbly huh we're so our minds are so dizzy with the the, the uh, intoxication of the world you, that you wobble back and forth along the path and you almost fall back into the ditch where your so-called friends are don't you you may even fall down there. You may go back to the bar some night. But I'll tell you, if you, do, if you go back to that bar, you're going to feel out of place there. Remember how at home you used to feel down at the bar? You're going to feel uncomfortable. And you, you know who's telling you you're uncomfortable? The spirit of truth tells you, get out of there. You'll get out of there. You, and then you'll be tempted to go back. You'll see that one of the elementary promises is fulfilled right in your life where instead of wobbling so much, you walk a little straighter, close down the line, right down the middle. Then you'll see, you'll hear your friends yell out from both sides. You'll see another promise fulfilled. But they can't tempt you anymore. You know one reason why they can't tempt you anymore? You on, on the, that road which is higher than the ditch, you look down there. I'll tell you, for the first time, you can look at the face of a man or a woman in that ditch and you and you can say how horrible I used to be there and I know how my face used to be now because I used to be there and you can see that man that man that woman that you used to admire that you were once in love with and you look, you look down there and you wonder how you could have ever been so foolish Right? That's the second one. Please remember all this. Our time is up, and that's enough for now. Take a break. How easy it is for you. You never have a new problem. All you have is the same old repetitious, habitual usual grindings, slammings, 
Every day you repeat yourself, don't you? You think that's making it easy on you. What a shame. What a tragedy that you never experience a new difficulty. It's always the same ones. Worry about money. Worry about a relationship. Worry about whether someone likes you or not. Worry about whether you're going to make it. And you don't even know what making it means. No wonder nothing happens internally that is different because you never put yourself in a different condition. You don't dare, unfortunately, to put yourself in a position where you will see through yourself where other people can see through you. I give you the most elementary exercise and opportunity for standing up here and see through yourself and let other people see through you and you think that's it. Please try to understand that anything you're given in this class is simply an example for you to go out and multiply 20-fold, 50-fold. Now, I'm going to start over and see if I can get the point over to you deeper. You never dare to expose your present chain of thoughts, way of life, to either yourself or anyone else. You play it safe, you play it comfortable. How many times have I told you that the way to shatter the old self-tormenting tra tormenting train of thoughts is for you to first see that it's there. And the only way you'll ever do that is to be so embarrassed at what you've been. You're not embarrassed at what you are. Oh, that word smugness. What an enemy. I can understand. I can understand well the world living smugly. I know that, and you to some extent know that. People want to run for public office, don't they? People want to invest money and get excited over what happens to the stock market the next day. But any problems they experience in connection with that, they have experienced 10,000 times before and never put themselves in a new position. You are supposed, supposed to, in this class, put yourself in a different condition where you, all of a sudden, and I've explained it so many times, all of a sudden you crack up and break down. Now, what is the marvelous purpose of that? The purpose of that is to knock out as fast and as thoroughly as possible all the conceit the unconscious conceit that you have in you whereby you say, I am smug, so I am safe. And you're so exhilarated <clears throat> over the fact that you have kept the blows from the world at least at a minimum. And you have kept self-exposure, exposure and shame at a minimum. It is quite clear to me why few human beings ever make it. Why few human beings ever transcend the nature that they were born with. Perfectly clear. You will not. You defy everything you hear in this room. You will not put yourself in a position where you see you can't do a single thing about anything. You still put value in tricks. You still think if you assume the proper facial expression or get the right education, get a little money, get a little security, and then act out your role, you think that that is the best you can do. And that is why that's the best you can do. 
I'm talking about something so profound that these words I'm talking to you with cannot penetrate it. This means that as these words go to you, that they have to come into your spirit and something has to penetrate. I know why you're not making it. You refuse to break down. The old habits are so strong. You remember the, the phrase, please don't hit me again. This is the way you live. The reason few people ever make it is because few people say, go ahead and hit me all you want. Do anything you want. Because I have to shatter something that is keeping me sick. You won't say that, will you? You do, you do the exact opposite of what you must do, don't you? The hideouts, the, the yearning for someone to hold you, the pleading to someone not to hurt your feelings anymore, the same old stage performance that you picked up when you were three and four years old. And that hardened when you started to go to school. And those other kids start getting after you and ridiculing you and laughing at you. <coughs> and the teacher embarrassed you and made you do certain things you didn't want to do. And you were bawled out and you failed on that test and you were the only kid, <coughs> you're the only kid in the whole classroom who failed something <coughs> or who didn't pass upward to the next grade, something like that. And you vowed you vowed to keep yourself what you call safe under all conditions by withdrawing. And do you know, by the way, that withdrawing can appear to be the opposite. You can appear to be an extrovert. You can be very bubbly outside, and pat people on the shoulder and smile a lot and go around pretending that it's all right. Do you remember how I started the talk last Saturday, one of the talks? I'll repeat it. Please write it down somewhere, at least up here. Stop pretending that it doesn't hurt. Well, aren't you? I know you are, don't you know you are? There is a horror. There is a horror, a tunnel of horror, that if you will enter and go all the way through, you will understand what I'm trying to get at tonight. You will see the horror of, of the most terrible thing you could ever do was to abandon, drop, cease all pretenses. Look, look, look how foolish we are. We know how we're living inside, don't we? How incredible that the darkness and the despair and the confusion that we have inside. How incredible that we react to that by saying, I won't let other people see that that is the way it is. Why would any human being make that stupid move as a correction? tell you why. We somehow think, listen, we somehow think that if others think well toward, toward us, that it will somehow change us. You don't know that you think that. What do you think people will run for public office and, and get their names in the paper? What do you think they're doing? Self-convincing millions of people voted for me or applauded me or said that was a marvelous book you wrote or a marvelous movie that you made, a great scientific 
discovery that you made. How utterly sick for any human being to look out there and say, please tell me the lie about myself so strongly and so persistently, so often. <laughs> please tell me a lie about myself so that I can believe it. You never, never will. And you never have. Now, you're led right into the beautiful trap, aren't you? Right now. Now you're going to have to choose whether you're going to keep up with the outer pretense, dressing a certain way to impress people, or whether you're going to enter the tunnel of horrors, walk right into it, and suffer the, the excruciating pain. It's painful enough for other people to see through you, but let me tell you, it is nothing compared to the incredible agony of you seeing through yourself because at that moment you cease to exist according to imagination and according to memory and according to vanity. Th that is what the horror is. The no longer existing in the unconscious state of smugness. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know how you're living. You don't understand also, you don't really, that the longer you go, the harder it is going to be for you to come back. It's too late. You listen to this, it's too late for most people. There's no way they can come back anymore. They've gone too far. And I'm telling you, it is my duty to tell you. I've been doing it for all these years. And the change is very, very little. Look, I understand. I understand if you keep coming here, it's because there's something right in you. I'm asking you why you are wasting so much time. I'm asking you why you were going so slow. I'm asking you why you ceased, why you still want to be a problem to yourself and to everyone else. I'm going to tell you one of the basic problems. You understand, I could say you have one problem or I could say you have 1,000 problems and they're all the same depending on the way you look at it. Listen to the following. Thousands of years ago, a certain man, a certain woman, over here and over there, somewhere in the world, made an astonishing discovery, a marvelous discovery. And this person who made this discovery tried to tell other people about it, but other people didn't want it at all. And this individual passed it on down in writings, and some people read the writings and others didn't. But this secret, which I'm going to give to you in a minute, exists right today. Now, it doesn't exist for the vast population over in China or France or Portugal or Egypt or anywhere else. But it exists for individuals. I'm going to explain it to you very carefully for the rest of the talk time that we have. The anxiety in this world breeds more anxiety, right? The crowd goes out and one of them throws a stone at a policeman or an armored car and all the other stone throwers pick them up and start throwing. Huh? Someone says, we've got all this military equipment just laying around, let's start a war. 
And so everyone cheers, let's start a war, and they destroy each other. Now, the same thing goes on internally with you. You are very contagious to yourself, as well as taking on the contagion of the outer world. Someone can say something to you and you react in kind, in a negative way. Here's what I'm getting at. You, think of it this way, you are answering the world with your neurosis. Careful. You are always answering the world. Now what's the world made up? Sickos of every description. People who are so far gone, they, they, they wouldn't want to come within 10 miles of this room. Now, they are talkers, and they're always talking to you in a thousand ways. In advertising, in political meetings, in religious meetings. The world is always talking to you. You overhear a conversation down where you work, and you react in a certain way to that. The world is constantly blabbing. All right, that's that part. You, without knowing it, because machines do not know that they are machines, you, without knowing it, are answering the world. And I'm going to give you the very key phrase of what we're talking about right now. You might want to write this down, too. As, simp as simple as this and when you see the power of this and go all the way with it, you won't indeed be the same woman, the same man. And here's the phrase. I have nothing to say to that. You know, as I'm seated here talking to you, I can feel that. I, I can feel it far better than I can express it to you. Let's try it again. I have nothing to say to that. The world talks to you. Give it that answer. I have nothing to say to that. You're always saying something to it. Stop it. That's a reminder. I know it's verbal. I know it's an idea. Start that as a reminder. I have nothing to say to that. I am not going to get involved with your madness. I have nothing to say. I used to. Didn't you, didn't you used to know the answers to everything on earth, to politics? You voted for that party. You went to that church. You knew if a certain law was passed or repealed or a certain economic system or social system was put into practice. See, you always had an answer. You had an answer out there, and you had an answer also as to how you could be content and happy. To prove it, you haven't found it yet. And the reason you haven't found it is because you have given a reply, guess out of what? You've given a reply from your old nature. You've given a reply, remember I talked at the start about your habitual nature always repeating itself, always saying the same thing. Nothing is new, no new, no new disgraces. Just the old ones of thinking of what happened to you when you were 10 years old and 20 years. No new disgraces. I feel very sorry for you unless you find one new disgrace to suffer from a day. You won't permit it. You're too hard. You're too protective. You still have too many answers. You still have too many defenses and, of course, equally, offenses. If you run out of answers, if you have nothing to say to that, no matter what that is, whether internal or external, <coughs> if you run out of replies, who's going to talk to you anymore? Now, I'm talking about something invisible. I'm talking psychology. You see, the reason you're hurt is because someone talks to you and you answer. If you don't answer, isn't that the same thing as not hearing the mad world when it tries to draw you in? Oh, sickies love each other, don't they? 
Sickies inflame each other, don't they? One sickie will say something knowing happily that the other will shout back in kind, right? This is what I'm talking about. That you're not going to stop the insane sane world from addressing you, from coming up to you. It insists, it demands, I know what's best for you. The man's ready for the psych award and he says, I know what's best for you. And he comes up and demands that you vote this way or agree with him. You join him in hating a third person. They demand it. And up till now, ladies and gentlemen, because you're so easy, easily cowed, intimidated, because you're, you have no strength at all, you meekly answer, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, whatever you say. And now you, now you think you've avoided the crisis, so you don't know what you've done against yourself. When you agree with that world out there, the equally sick world inside of you, you don't know what you've done. You've taken another step downhill. Now you're going to have to come up that step. It's going to be harder. You've taken one more. Just so that people, remember I said earlier, so that people will like you. And so that they will give you a sense of assurance that you can't find in yourself. The only place you'll ever find it is in yourself. Why do you look out there? Because you are too lazy. You're too smug to ever go, go inside and so disturb yourself that everything is upset. So that you're disgraced as often as possible. So that you're not hiding your little petty bluffs, your little petty lies. So that you can catch yourself in your dozens of petty lies all day long. <coughs> your facial expressions, which are not matched inwardly inside. So, if you say, you know, first you say it with your intellect, because you're now in the learning stage. If you say, I, I have nothing to say to that, you're not giving any reply at all, that ends the matter! There's nothing more to do, nothing more to say, nothing more to feel, you are out of it! I have nothing to say to that. That ends it. Oh, that's psycho and that's sicky. They're not going to give up that easy on you because they've been successful with you and with everyone else all their life. And they know, they know where they have to feed off of. With, without you, they can't exist as them. You think they're going to give you up overnight? They're going to keep hounding you and watch your face for the little moisture that indicates weakness, for the doubtful look, the doubtful word. They're going to hound you, keep after you, until you give in. And they, they almost, almost always win. We're here to put a stop to it. Now you do some thinking. If you start, just start with the attitude and you can say it verbally, you can say it out loud to people. But most of all, you're trying to, to build an inner attitude. I have nothing to say to that. The other person challenged you. He was angry. He offered you something you don't really want. And your only answer is simply, I have nothing to say to that. That's the end of it. Now think, as I talk, think of all the other rewards. You can break down rewards. The great reward, of course, is to be free of you. What other reward do you want in this world? Since the only enemy you have is you, wouldn't the greatest reward and refreshment be not to have to live with you anymore? But break it down. Look at the more, more obvious ones for a while. If you say, I have nothing to say to that, that cuts off the waste of energy, doesn't it, right there? Here you have, before you used to turn on all the lights, you know, and waste all that wattage, and you shut them off. Look at, look at what you're saving and the energy that is saved to do other things with. And, th and think of all the rewards that will come from that one act. Now, there is such a thing as spiritual 
concentration and I want you to go into it. <coughs> I want you to think, you go home, you do a little homework for once, overnight, tomorrow, sometime. You take a list and you put down <coughs> at the top of the list, I have nothing to say to that. And you make your long point by point, you know how we do it very often, one, two, three, make as many facts, statements after that as you can and oh, you, you know, the rewards of the world, how long do they last? The nice dinner, the nice flattery. There's something in you that can feel the difference in the two. And when you look at that list, there's something in you that will get genuinely excited over it. And you'll say, well, you know, it's very strange. But I've never noticed up until now, you may say this when you look at that long list, you say, I never noticed before how uninvolved I was with my life. <laughs> it was my life and I had nothing to do with it. You'll clap your hand to your forehead ten times when you see who had to do with it. Mama, here you are, 30, 40, 60 years old, and Mama still has to do with your life. And you'll see it. And Papa, and that ex-husband and ex-wife, those former, what you called friends, were they not leading your life for you? Were they not influencing you so that you really didn't have a life of your own? When you meet any situation, one of two things always happens. Real slow. When you meet any situation, whatever, one of two things happens. The situation takes charge or you take charge. Right? Huh? Now, which would you say it is presently? Does it the situation take charge, which merely means that you are living your life from the outward to the inner. It goes from there to here, right? You see that person's face and you react. Why don't you try it the other way sometime to see what happens and there'll be no stopping you after that. Where you live your life from inward to outward. You see that other person's face. You, you see the ad on the billboard. Something, some challenge comes along. Wouldn't you like to be in charge of that billboard from now on? Wouldn't you like to be in charge of that temptation? Wouldn't you like to be in charge of that, that memory, that sex memory, that shame memory? Wouldn't you like to be in charge of yourself instead of the chaos, inward chaos, being in charge? Don't you ever then again answer chaos and confusion in you when it wants to take you over. I don't care where the, where the source is, whether it's out there or inside, it doesn't make any difference. It's really all one thing. If you could see it, they flow together. Wouldn't you like to be in charge of everything that happens to you? There's a requirement. I've given it to you and we'll go over it again in another way. Think of the word surge. You know, surges, something surges. If you can catch the surge of your usual reply to the world, at the point of it surging, you can still put an end to it. That is, something in you can still put an end to it. Once the surge has gone too far, once the wave has broken, it splashes all over and covers you up, right? It's got you. If you can catch the ocean wave, it starts to, you can ever, you know, think of an actual down at the beach. You can see it way out there, can't you? You can see it coming little by little, and it builds and builds and builds, and they crash with the white water and the green water all mixed up. We're talking now about watchfulness, aren't we? You can begin to watch the surge of you getting an answer and give it, ready to give an answer, and it will always be the same one. I'll tell you how to do something different. It'll be so shocking to you, you won't know what to believe. 
Watch the surging answers start to come up. And you're, you're, you don't do anything, you understand. But your very watching of it will put an end to the surge. And you will not say what you usually say. You will not feel what you usually feel. You will not do what you usually do. There is no, listen, there is no safety in being unsafe. There is no safety in being unsafe. You are unsafe the way you're handling life now. And you know you are. The fact that you're hostile means you're unsafe. Look at the, how can I put it? The, the logic, the reason, sim more simply. You will be unsafe by answering the world as you usually do from your old conditioned nature. Right? Okay, will you agree to that? All right. Now, I will tell you that there is an opposite to that. Because we're talking in terms of opposites, and it's all right as long as you understand that you're talking in terms of opposites. The opposite of giving a sick reply to a sick world, the opposite of that is remaining silent. Maybe, maybe, remember I told you about the man who discovered the secret? Maybe he's the first one who said silence is golden. You can track that back from some little thing you read in a children's book. It's true, silence is golden, isn't it? Not? Gold is something that's valuable. How many of you have a chattering mind? That's not very golden, is it? It's not very valuable, is it? You can then can catch yourself at the start of doing the usual thing, and you remember what I said that it will eventually leave you in an unsafe condition. You'll say, ah, as, as hard as it is to do, as overwhelmingly difficult, I am going to challenge this contradiction where I say, if I snap back at you when you snap at me, I'll feel safe. See, I'm protecting myself. The answer is no, that's wrong. I won't feel safe. I'll be nervous for one thing, and that's not safe. I see that. I have an ounce of intelligence to see when I'm nervous I'm wrong. Therefore, I will try to remain awake so that something other than me handles the challenge from the world, the question. And when that question comes, I'm going to stay so awake I'm going to so disgrace myself by not having an answer, by being what I call stupid, I'm going to say, stay silent just to see what happens. Oh, there's going to be a great crash inside of you. You know what that crash is? Throwing a telephone pole in front of the rushing truck. But you have stopped that truck a little bit. Just a little bit. You put a telephone pole in front of a big truck, it's going to stop it a little bit. Right? Then you do that tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Pretty soon the truck has stopped. The truck, that destructive truck was just knocking everything aside, running into people, running into objects as it goes down. That truck is your answer to the world. Your hundreds of different, varied, wrong answers. A wrong person will give wrong answers. Now, try to get out of that logic, right? Now, if a wrong person feels the pain of it and wants to be right because he doesn't want to suffer anymore, then he will actively work to not follow along with the mechanical impulses and surges that come up from the world. I tell you, the first time you see that you can handle it different, you, you'll be stunned, nicely stunned. Ah, I didn't know that there was another way. There is another way and you will see it. You thought, you thought you had to growl back. You thought you had to feel hurt. That was your answer. On and on and on. The light exists. Truth exists. It will work for you as you receive it. Now, remember the main point. Put it in any words you want. I don't have an answer to that. But get it into your memory and let it go into your spiritual memory 
that for your sake you can no, no longer reply to the world the way you usually have. Now, if you don't reply the way you usually do, what else is there? There is silence and that is the reply that is different. That is the reply that is coming from something higher than you. God is silent. He's not like this world. Can you imagine truth answering uh, an assault? An accusation, an anger. Can you imagine truth going in kind with these negativities? You can't, can you? So silence is, silence is beautiful and silence Silence is different and silence is spiritual. All right, pursue this all the way to see what it means to be spiritually silent. And you'll walk through this noisy world and you won't hear a thing offensive. Not having any money. You got it, Alicia? I got it now. I can go on. Okay. Poor, poor broke, barely making it, barely able to pay the bills. And the cause of human poverty is human beings. What else? The trees didn't cause it. The stars didn't cause it, in spite of what the astrologers will tell you. The ocean waves didn't cause it. Eliminate everything else, and you find out there's one cause of being poor, which is the way the human mind presently operates. Now, not having lots of money is no problem at all. We understand you have to pay rent. We're not talking about that. We're talking about how people who by the law of accident in this mad accidental world are either rich or poor or somewhere in between. Now, if it happens that you're having a tough time making it, barely making it, you have only one problem on earth which is your wrong connections with your own poorness. Poor people. Don't feel sorry for poor people because they're poor. Poor people are in that way to begin with because there's a certain contribution of their own, but that's another thing altogether. But if you aren't making it financially, I know what's going on inside of your mind. Let's run a few off. Guilt. I didn't make it. There are millions of people in this world. I didn't make it. What comes out of that? Jealousy. What comes out of that? Violence. People who don't have something go crazy and say, I must have something, and he's the one who's got it. I have a right to take it. It belongs to me, not to him. Because egotism thinks it's the only person in the world. If you were purely mentally healthy and had just five cents in your pocket, you would have no problems at all. That's one part of it. Another part. Why, are, why is there poverty at all on earth? One word. I'll tell you just one word. It'll explain the whole situation. Why you read about malnutrition here and there? It is called wastage. Human beings get up in the morning and spend all of their time doing everything possible to cause shortage, to cause wastage. Egotism does nothing but try to prove itself. Therefore, when it takes an apple or takes a piece of wood, it wastes it. And I've gone over this particular thing before, but I'll go over it again. You go out anywhere now, nowadays, right now, and try to buy a home for a reasonable price, the kind of a home that you want. You can't do it, can you? Well, the lowest we have is $80,000. $80,000, all I need is one room. They're going to charge you $80,000. They're not going to build a house for you for $15,000 because there's no money in it. See wastage. All that room nobody needs, but there's bigger profit. You try to buy an automobile that runs economically. Impossible. Go ahead, try. I've been trying for years. I can't do it, and neither can you. There's no way that society will let a human being have what he really needs. 
you'll take what we give you and that's the end of it. No wonder, no wonder there's such a thing as poor people in the world. But a final point on poverty. If there was no wrong connections between your five cents only in your pocket and your mind, if you didn't go wrong psychologically on it, there'd be no difficulty at all because there would be no you thinking about your state. That is the state, but it's not you. It's there. And you see the insanity of the world. And you get a great relief in that you think, among other things, you think, after all these years, I see it. I didn't cause my own poverty, therefore why should I feel guilty? It's a part of the, the low level of madness of the earth. You're no more the cause of your own poorness than a rich man's the cause of his richness. That's the way it worked on the law of accident. Two men go to the same high school, go out in the world. One happens to go left, the other goes right. One becomes a millionaire and the other has nothing, right? And both are sick. I highly advise you to grow healthy in your spirit. So that regardless of your condition, it means nothing to you. What do you, what do you think Christ ever gave one thought to the fact that he didn't have a place to lay his head? You think he was concerned with that? He was poor. You're making a lot of unnecessary trouble for yourself. Here's our enemy comparison again. By thinking about other people. <laughs> Look, I'll tell you what to do sometime. Next time you see that nice big home overlooking the lake, several rooms, double stories, brand new, you know. $1,000 a month taxes, probably. You just don't do this literally or you, the cops will pick you up for loitering. But you just look at their faces when they come out and when they go in. What have they got? They've got nothing. Now you say you've heard this all your life that money can't make you happy. You still believe it can. I gave you an illustration once and for the sake of those who knew I'll say it again because it, oh it's powerful. Oh it'll, it'll knock out all the grief, all the regrets, all the I in you. Not too long ago, even little as eight or nine years, you could come to this city and buy a nice home for $20,000. A nice, you know, average home, two, three bedroom, $20,000. Today what? 80000 All right. All right. <laughs> and you, let's say you rented and you didn't buy a home. And everybody talks about it. Your next door neighbor brags about it. I bought that house for 20 Now look, I got a house for eighty. That man is sick. He's not coming into this house, into this room. You're going to stay in his house. He says that to you, you know, I bought that, you know, I made $60,000. Watch yourself. Look at the agony in you when he says that, which shows that you are a slave to a mere idea. I'm trying to get you to see how much you suffer and you don't know it. It happens all the time. Oh, if I'd only bought that house. How, how can I tell you it wouldn't make any difference? How can I tell you you're living in, in dreamland to think it would make any difference to you? Let the mad world do what it wants economically, which it is. It'll always do what it wants. Let, let those sick people with their, with their hard faces, those, those psychopaths who want to pass laws for their benefit, let all those sickies have this world in their $100,000 houses and their expensive cafes. There is no sicker place on this earth than a high-priced cafe. You don't think so? Don't go in there. You know where I'll take you. <laughs> it has a big arches in the front of it. <laughs> You go into one of these high-class cafes, $20 for a dinner. That's cheap, I guess, nowadays, huh? And look at all those devils and what they are. What, look what those devils are doing. They don't know it. They don't know it. Here's 100 people in this cafe. There was one next to a big motel that we were at. Great big place. I forbade everybody to go within 10 miles of it. 
hundred people inside of there, all those devils destroying each other, wasting, throwing away money. Look, all you need is food, is just simple food. You know? Now, apply that to everything else. All right, on to something else. Now, you're all free of all your problems with money, right? <laughs> this connects somewhat to what the preliminary remarks. Here's a man, he goes out. He has lots of friends, a man who's lonely like you are and empty as you are. And he goes out to his friend's house all the time and one friend has a swimming pool. So he goes over and swims in his friend's, friend's swimming pool and they have their champagne and all that. Shall I spell it again? C-H-A-M-P-A-G-N-E <laughs> is pronounced champagne if you look at it that way. And he comes home and a few days later he gets he gets restless again. And he knows a friend who has a horses out in the country, you know, big estate. So he goes out and rides the horses around. His friends invite him in for dinner. He goes for dinner and goes home. And he gets restless again. You, how many of you are always running somewhere, in spite of all I tell you, always running somewhere? The only place you should run is to this room fast. <laughs> goes out the third time. His friend has a boat on a big lake. And he rides on his friend's boat, comes on back. And it suddenly occurs to him something. Something suddenly occurs to him. I'm sure restless. I'm always going somewhere. I wonder why. Ah, he finally sees why he has to keep running somewhere. And you listen to this. Running out to the lake, <coughs> out to the riding stables, and out to the swimming pool. <coughs> he has to keep going places because he has nothing of his own. He doesn't have his own swimming pool. All right, now, don't connect this too much with what I said before, because I want to stop the illustration there, or you'll get all thoroughly confused. How do you expect to get something of your own when you're always borrowing? You do it here. Not that there's anything wrong with normal sociality. There is right sociality. We talk to people because we are able to talk to each other, right? You like to look at people. You're a human being. It's normal to look and see other human beings, certain ones of them anyway. <laughs> Others you kind of avoid as much as humanly possible. There's a wrong kind of going out, which, is, which, which starts with hope. If I go out this morning and go to that certain place, I will get, listen to this, here's what's unconsciously going on to, to runners around her. If I, if I go out, I will get something from that group or from that person that I don't have in myself. I will get a temporary charge of electricity. I will feel okay for a little bit. I'll talk with him and I'll feel accepted. I keep telling you, observe your state very carefully, as you mentioned the other day. Observe your state very carefully once the party is about to fold up. You know, the musicians put the violinist, puts his violin in the case, and the waiters start looking at you and clearing off the table a little faster than usual. And the party is all over. Look, look at your condition. See, you have nothing of your own. I'll tell you what you have to do. You have to stay home. You have to stay home and endure the pain. Go through it night after night after night. No more champagne, no more dancing. No more little lights up in the ceiling, you know. That thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, you know, it goes around and makes lights all over. The How many know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not advocating that you stay home and fix your own little lights. <laughs> Stay home until you can't bear your own company anymore. And then bear it some more after that. Here's what will happen. Crack. Bang. Something will shatter inside of you. You'll fall to the floor psychologically. You'll be limp. <sighs> That's the major operation. Stay there till something happens. Don't try to make it happen. That's what you're doing when you go out. 
thrill me, young man, hold me close, the lady is saying. He's a monster, ladies. He holds you close because he wants something from you because he's as empty as you are. Two empty people dancing with each other. Each with their little private schemes, right? The man wants sex and the woman wants security. And there it is, right? right. The man wants sex and the woman wants someone to take care of her, which is proper on its own level. So you're going to stay home, you keep running, going to keep running around. I'm talking about a psychological state, an interstate. Where are you running around hoping, hoping that something will turn out according to your desire? You're not going to have a thing if it does, because you projected that desire out into the world and said, if I have this, I'll feel complete. You, the poor man, projected that desire and you get poverty back. You always get back what you put out. You should know that by now. Now, if you cease all operations, if you stop operating, if you stay home, there's a law that says if you stop, something else will start. And you know what that something else is? If you don't, you can find out for yourself. Stay home. Collapse on the floor. Oh, go. Look, you refuse hell. That's why you don't grow. You refuse hell. You refuse agony. You want to think, you think your, your husband is strong, your wife is strong, or you're going to find a man or woman who's strong, or your bank account is going to be strong, or your daydreams are going to be strong. I'll tell you what you're doing. You're, you're dreaming your life away, and you don't know that you're dreaming. We're here to shock ourselves awake. The sooner the better.